Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the podcast for the American Monetary Association. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is a service of my private foundation, the Jason Hartman Foundation. Today, we have a great interview for you, so I think you'll enjoy it. And comment on our website or our blog post. We have a lot of resources there for you, and you can find that at AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org. That's AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org, or the website for the foundation, which is JasonHartmanFoundation.org. Thanks so much for listening, and please visit our website and enjoy our extensive blog and other resources there. It's my pleasure to welcome Chris Mayer back to the show. He has been on before, and he is the author of two newsletters for Agora Financial, Capital and Crisis and Mayer's Special Situations. And the thing I like about Chris is that he, although he is a, I'm going to call him a, a stock person. And Chris, you may object to that, I know. So just give me a moment. <laughs> I'm going to call him a stock person. And you know, I usually don't like to invest in stocks and, and things like that, where you don't have control of, of, of things. I like being a direct investor. But the great thing about Chris is, is that he wrote a book called Invest Like a Deal Maker, And it's really taking the approach of what is the underlying value of the asset, the commodity. So we talk a lot on, on the show about buying investment property, income property, far below the cost of replacement or far below the cost of construction. And that's what Chris recommends doing with companies. He also has some new opinions and thoughts on the housing market, which we'll hear about today, and just some really interesting insights. So Chris, welcome back. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me back. It's good to be on. And you're coming to us from Baltimore, Maryland today? I am in Baltimore, yep. Okay, great. Well, tell us a little bit about if you want to expand on on my thoughts about investing like a deal maker. Yeah, I thought you had a pretty good characterization of it. I don't mind being called a stock picker. I think that's all right. That's uh, I think of all Peter Lynch and some of those guys. But to talk more about the deal making aspect, what makes that different is that like you, actually, I'm not really interested in owning stocks, just any stocks. And so I'm more interested in thinking like a deal maker and that is they're thinking about things like the assets and control and they're thinking about the business as a whole sort of what can be done with it uh, as opposed to when you hear a lot of uh, more amateur stock pickers they'll mostly focus on things like well what's the price earnings ratio or what's the dividend yield and you know what's the growth rate but when you talk about deal makers and a deal maker might be as an example somebody like a Carl Icahn or somebody who's buying or selling whole companies or someone who's more of a direct investor and has control over that investment and they tend to look at them in a much different way. So I've tried to focus my investing activities around sort of the way uh, those folks look at businesses and one of those ways is you, you talked about replacement value and that's really a big part of it because you, the housing analogy is perfect and I've used that analogy before to describe it to people how it works. If you can buy a house for less than significantly less than what it costs you to construct it you may have a pretty good deal there and you can apply that same kind of analysis in the stock market where you can sometimes find companies where the assets uh, that you can buy in the stock market cost you far less than what it would cost someone else to build them from scratch. Absolutely. Now, I want to talk to you a lot about housing today because that is you know, a primary focus of, of the show or, or I should say real estate investing. But before we do that, let's talk for a moment, if we could, about the financial services industry, Wall Street, stock pickers. You've talked about investing like a deal maker, which I think is a fantastic way to look at it. The investment bankers, the, the corporate takeover guys back in the 80s, the people that would green mail the board and uh, you know uh, sp cut up the company and sell off the assets and you know a lot of people characterize them as evil and so forth but they really in a lot of ways had the right idea because they looked at the underlying value of the assets of the company and sometimes what we really realized from all that stuff going on in the 80s is that the company uh, is, is worth more when you you buy the stock to gain control and sell off all the assets like the pieces of real estate the equipment the goodwill the trademarks etc than actually running the company itself right that's right. And I think, I think the big problem uh, that we found in American finance and why the, the corporate takeovers became part of the reason why they came onto the scene so strong is that we found that a lot of American corporations really what they lacked was owners. They lacked somebody who was there watching the shop. They lacked someone there who was thinking creatively about the assets that they had and what they might do with them. They lacked an entrepreneur. 
So uh, if you look at some of the, the best investments over the last 50 years, you'll find that um, they were almost always had a, a dominant entrepreneur as, as part of it. So you look at Walmart, you, know, you had Sam Walton. You look at Apple, you had Steve Jobs. You look at Amazon, you had Jeff Bezos. You look at, there was just a long, long list of companies where you had this sort of controlling insider, an owner, and someone who thought long-term about the business and had a vested interest in doing the right thing over the long term. And that's really what I'm focusing on. So when I think about deal makers, I'm also thinking what I'm really looking for is, is an owner, someone who is there. Uh, and what I don't like is the trend in American finance, and really it's a problem all over the world, where you have corporate management teams that have really no stake in the businesses that they manage, or the stake that they have is given to them with low-cost options. So their incentive really isn't for them to think long-term about the business. The incentive is for them to keep their, their cushy positions. Right, and their and their big salaries and their bonuses, and what they end up doing is is kind of raping and pillaging the company usually, and taking too much out of it so that it can't operate correctly. But you know, when you talk about like Sam Walton and Steve Jobs, and there are many other examples too, rather than just the quote unquote like financial people, the business people, what you're talking about there is the is the guy that is watching the store. Those companies had a had a soul. They had a person who was at stake, who really saw a vision and really cared. No one cares as much as the shopkeeper about the shop. And of course, this is why big government doesn't work. This is why socialism doesn't work. This is why communism doesn't work. Because yeah, it's applicable to a wide it, range of things. It, sure it is. And and it's 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 why relationships and marriages don't work sometimes. Yeah, it's all based <laughs> on incentives and who has ownership. Yeah, yeah. And, and who believes in it and who's at stake for sure. So those, what I would say about the companies that you mentioned is that they had a soul. They didn't just have a financial person who was looking to just tear it up and, and, and just make make their tenure for four or five years. And you know, the thing about it is too, we, we talk about a lot of the famous examples and we could talk a lot about those, but there's also, and this is why I spent a lot of time trying to ferret out, is there are other companies too that people probably have never heard of that also have uh, you look at a CEO and he's the co-founder and he owns 17% of the shares or he owns 25% of the shares or there's a family involved that, that owns a big stake in the business. And it's remarkable because it's not only that these businesses, uh, you mentioned before that they take out, try to take out as much as they can or we, we both talk about how they just try to protect their salaries. But when you have a, a person behind it like that, they're also willing to change and make and push the business forward because uh, you know, if you have a caretaker management, they're not necessarily, sometimes they can take really big risks because they have no, nothing to lose really, but sometimes they can also be caretakers and that they take no risks. And really what you need to thrive is you need an entrepreneur. You need someone who is going to push the company in new directions. I mean, Steve Jobs is a classic example. He's had a tremendous impact on Apple. And you can look at Apple while he was CEO, Apple while he wasn't CEO, and Apple when he was CEO again, and the performances, there's marked differences between those different periods. And you can do this across the board. You can look at IBM and look at it when the Watsons were running it, and then IBM post-Watson. You can look at almost any company, and, and you can see uh, marked, remarkable differences when there's not this person at the helm that you're mentioning. So, yeah, I think it's very important. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And one of the things I'd say to listeners who are investing in, in income property is that that person is you. You are that person who has a passion about it, and you are the shopkeeper. You're the person who cares. Instead of relinquishing your hard-earned money to some guy at Merrill Lynch who sticks it in a couple of mutual funds, and and you don't have any soul in that. There's there's just no no one has thrown themselves into it. And, and you know what's interesting, Chris? You, you talk about Steve Jobs, and I'd encourage any of our listeners to do this because it's such a great story. Of course, it's a big story, so it's not really applicable to a lot of investors, but it it illustrates the point that you're making. And there's a website. I, I one night I just got kind of interested and I did it. You know, when Steve Jobs, I was there was some news about his illness on on the news and I, I just looked it up and it was all of Steve Jobs' major speeches from the very beginning of Apple and and you know all through the years and I watched them in chronological order and it took a couple hours as I recall to do this and and it was just really interesting and I remember when I I bought my first company back uh, like 13 years ago when I'd give a speech. 
I, there was that same twinkle in my eye. I had that passion for the business that Steve Jobs had, and, and that's really important. Oh, yeah. And it's funny you mention that because I did something similar. <laughs> I looked at I looked at his speeches, and there was one commencement address he gave. I think it was at Stanford. At Stanford, was, yeah. That was, was about three brilliant. years ago. It was awesome, yeah. It's a classic, yeah, and I would it. certainly encourage anyone to read that. And the passion for what he does clearly comes through there. But other things about Jobs that I've come across also that are interesting is when you look at the number of times he's failed – you know, there's a lot, again, this is a whole entrepreneurial thing about being creative and trying things. And, you know, he's had his share of that, but he's also had tremendous successes. So all this, I think, plays in plays into what we're talking about. It sure does. And I always say to people, if you want to succeed more often, it's really pretty easy. Just increase your failure rate. Yeah. And, and, in fact, <laughs> Bill Bonner, who's, uh, the, as you know, is the founder of Agora, he always says, fail, but fail quickly. So there's no stigma to failing. We just, you know, get it done and move on. If it doesn't work, we do the next thing. So. Right. The problem is most people wallow in it and poor me and it's a pity party and they don't move on from their failures. But the, the failures can be great educations. Nixon said, failure that does not destroy you strengthens you. And I, I firmly believe that's true. But on the financial services industry, before we talk about some specific companies and housing and real estate and that stuff, I just wanted to give the comparison because I think there's sort of maybe three major tiers. There's the tier of the mainstream financial services industry, which I think is it's been in a bubble for a few decades. The bubble has burst. I think people have discovered that the emperor has no clothes, that walking into Ameriprise or Merrill Lynch or any of the other companies that sell you a bill of goods, a bunch of stupid mutual funds, it just doesn't work. I think that industry is over and it blows my mind. The people I know personally as friends in that industry, nice people, etc. But when I ask them questions, their knowledge is just so elementary. I mean, they just don't have any details. It sounds like they listened to the morning call at Merrill Lynch and they heard, this is what we're going to say today. And they just go on and they repeat that spiel to all the clients. And, and and you look at the commercials for these companies on TV. I don't mean to pick on Merrill or Ameriprise. I just happen to mention those two names. There's a whole industry of them. I'm, I'm speaking of them generically because they advertise and they're big. Okay. But the, the, the commercials, the advertising for these companies is so generic. It is amazing, these big image ads of people retiring and living the good life. And frankly, I don't know anyone who's followed their plan that has achieved that situation of living yeah, the good the, life. You know, I guess uh, there's not a lot of people in the Forbes 400 or whatever that uh, <laughs> have done it by investing in mutual funds. But uh, no, I certainly agree with your point. And also, I think a lot of it falls on, on people because they invest in these things. And, you know, I have good friends too that have uh, money in these mutual funds. And and these are people who will go out of their way to save money on, you know, gasoline or who, who go the extra mile and, you know, when they want to buy a washing machine or anything like that, checking consumer reports, talking to people. And yet when it comes to thousands and thousands of dollars, there are life savings. You know, or hundreds commit. or thousands of yeah, or hundreds millions. Of yeah, right. They'll commit on nothing more than, oh, the, the flimsiest of, you know, rationale. So. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the guy reading all the reviews on Amazon.com before he buys a, a $200 printer. Yet, <laughs> you know, he, he's yeah, going to... Yeah, when it comes to mutual fund, you know, five stars from morning or whatever, in it goes. Exactly, exactly. So, so, the, so the next tier, okay, that was one tier. The, I'm just going to call that like the mainstream financial services industry. The next tier is the tier that you mentioned of, I'm going to call them like stock pickers. So these would include, and I'm a big fan of this name that I'm about to mention, by the way, I really want to get him on my show, like people like Charles Payne. And I like Charles Payne. I think he's great. Jim Cramer, who maybe I like less. <laughs> um, and, and all of the people out there giving like specific stock recommendations. That would be like the next tier, which I think is is better than the mainstream financial services industry. But I think the top tier is the tier of investing like a deal maker. And that includes being a direct investor sometimes, or at least investing in something where you know that the founder or the operator has absolute vision and passion for the company, and you're buying the assets far below their replacement cost. Would, would you agree that those are like three different tiers of maybe that investors interface with out there yeah i think that's uh, those are those are interesting tiers and i i think that two of those things you nailed are are very important i mean i have a, a system i use when i pick stocks and i have a an acronym so people can easily remember it and the acronym is code and c is cheap which you mentioned is buying below replacement value o is for ownership and we want people to have a stake in the business that we invest in so that's two of the four right there the d being disclosures meaning it has to be something that's transparent uh, transparency is very important 
uh, meaning that we can understand the business, we know how they make money, we can follow it. And E is for excellent financial condition, which covers for a lot of sins. We don't want to invest in things that have an excessive amounts of leverage or, or that kind of thing. So those are kind of my four pillars of how I look at, look at these so stocks. So say, say the code again, just so people get it. Yep, code C is cheap, specifically buying below replacement value. O is for ownership. We want people to have a stake in the business. And D is for disclosure, which has to do about with the transparency of the business. We can understand what's going on. And E is for excellent financial condition. So we're not, we want to invest in things that are excessively leveraged. But those, those are the core principles. Right, right. So th- we've got these three tiers. Now, let's talk about the corporate world and the, and the stock world for a moment. And, th- and then I want to talk about real estate stuff. What do you like out there and why do you like it? Yeah, well, um, that's a good question. I think right now is a very, very uh, sort of uncertain time. And so one of the things that I've fallen back on is to look at what the insiders themselves are buying. Uh, and that's been a big part of uh, the last couple of months that I've been writing these letters because one, one of the most remarkable things we had that we saw in this called the August crash is that we saw insiders come out of pocket and start buying stock at, at numbers that we haven't seen since since 2009 or the early part of 2009. So that certainly got my attention. And, and that's really a um, kind of an interesting response to a crisis because a lot of people have sold. If you look at uh, individual investors, they're pulling money out of mutual funds in, at record levels. So they have a tendency to take money out at the bottom and put it back in when things are going well. And the insiders tend to be a, a different, give you a different indicator. So th- this is a kind of an interesting time because normally thematically I might tell you, you know, certain stocks I like, whether I like energy or I like this or I like that. But right now it's more patchy. And so I'm, I'm picking and choosing among things that where the insiders are buying, where the fundamental business seems to be uh, very profitable and have a bright future. So I can mention specific names if you want. I don't know if that's yeah, part yeah, of cool no, Oh, no, no, absolutely. I'd love you to mention some specific names. But before you do that, the insider thing, I mean, certainly that seems like great advice. I mean, I want to buy into something where the insider has faith in their own deal. I want my partners in that, in that venture to be at stake, right? You never want a partner who's not at stake and doesn't have, quote unquote, skin in the game, right? Right. And some of them have proven to be pretty, pretty good buyers of their own stock. So either you know, there's some of these CEOs you look at and you say, well, the last time I bought, you know, the stock was here and look what happened and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So the one thing, though, that could sort of tilt this equation and make it maybe a little less valid, I'm just trying to be a skeptic here for a moment, so forgive me, but just sort of the general economic environment where there's just loads of money that's been sitting on the sidelines for the last few years, and and maybe the reason the insiders are buying more is because they just sort of have this money available that they got to do something with it, and one of the things they're doing is buying their own stock, but they're also doing other stuff too. Your thoughts? That? Well, my experience is that the that the insiders won't buy their own stock unless they're unless they're pretty confident. Now, there's there are some insiders that you'll look and they'll they'll be token purchases, and so those you'll discount. There are some insiders that buy that maybe they're on the board or something, and that's probably less of a signal than if you had the CEO and the CFO and the chairman of the board all buying the active operations. The people. active, yeah, yes, right. and and so there there is something to that. And I also would lean back on a lot of the more academic research that's been done on this, which which shows that insider purchases as a whole outperform the market, depending on what study you cite, something between 6 and 10% percentage points a year, there can be outperformance there. So I think there can be a lot of skepticism because I've, when I've talked to people about this, I thought you were going to say, because I've heard this objection before, is people say, well, you know, there's a lot going on with the economy now. There's a lot of bad stuff in Europe and bad stuff in the credit so, market. So they're moving the money back to the thing. So they, they don't really yeah. know. To say they don't really understand the macro situation, sort of discounting that, they're, okay, well, their company might look good, but it might be overwhelmed by, you know, events. So that's the theory of there's no other place to put the money, so they think their company is the best safe haven, in other yeah, words. Yeah, so the other thing you've got to remember, too, with the insiders, they've already, in a way, they're, most of them are betting pretty heavily on the company. I mean, they, they, get, uh, they may have a big stake already. They might have, you know, they get their salaries and livelihood out of it. So for them to then reach in their own pocket and put more money in is usually a pretty strong statement. Of course, there are exceptions, and nothing's perfect, but in general... If you can buy, you know, you've got a chairman and CEO and they're buying million dollar shots of the, of the stock at a time and, and you can buy right alongside them. I mean, that's usually something interesting. 
I agree at. with you. I agree with you. The only thing I'd love to see, and I, I doubt this is even possible, is a study of the amount the insider holds of that company's stock in relation to their own personal net worth. For example, so if an insider buys a million dollars worth of stock in their own company, but their net He's worth, a billionaire. The, yeah, but their net worth is a hundred million or a billion dollars, that's chicken feed to them, right? It's it's nothing. So it looks good on paper that hey, that insider's buying, but they might just be doing that to sort of make it look good. And they might just only have a moderate faith in the company, but they're throwing a few bones at it, whereas they've got so much net worth outside of the company. That would be a great study. Yeah, I don't know that I've seen studies that address it quite that way, but there are studies that show that CEOs that have at least some percentage at stake in the business outperform. So I've seen CEOs where they've done the threshold at 10% and they look at their stocks and compare it to control group where the CEOs own much less percentage and the CEOs which have a bigger percentage in the business do well. So there's something to holding a sizable stake in the business, but I haven't seen any relative to their own net worth, which would be more difficult to do as you, you suggest because you'd have to know their personal financial statements and so forth. Yeah, and a lot of these guys also are, I mean, I've been in this business writing newsletters for seven years and before that I was in corporate banking for 10 years. I mean, a lot of them, in addition, even though they may have 10% of their net worth in a company, there's quite a bit of ego involved in a lot of this and there's a certain pride in, in being part of a successful company and a company that does well. So some of that, I mean, you know, I, I don't know uh, that company that they're going to throw money at something and deliberately in an effort to deceive people. But I mean, I'm sure that's happened at some point. But as a general rule, you know, I... I think it's probably not the case. Well, and the ego is definitely a powerful thing. So that's that's good that they have ego in the game. I want them to have their ego invested in it. Yeah, you want uh, them. Yeah, to. yeah, absolutely. Well, tell the listeners some of the things you like and why. Maybe three examples would be good. Okay. Well, uh, one recent example that I've recommended is a company called Federal Mogul, which uh, Carl Icahn actually owns seventy six percent of the stock. So you definitely have a an owner there, and this is a company that makes auto parts. And it's fallen quite a bit in the August sell-offs, down about $15 or so. And he's been buying it you know, for about two weeks straight in August there. During the collapse, he was buying it at a million dollars a shot. Now, we know that Carl Icahn is a billionaire, so you can make of that what you will. But he owns 76% of it. And the other thing I like about it is the CEO has a particular incentive. He, uh, when Icahn took out Federal Mogul out of bankruptcy, he brought in his own hand-picked CEO, again, a guy named Alapont. And he has... Uh, option to buy 4 million shares at 1950. So when the stock hit $27 a share earlier in the year, he didn't sell or exercise any of his options, though he could have. The options expire in 2014. So I think that's a good incentive there. I think the alignment of all the incentives that I look for are set up really well here at Federal Mogul. Uh, and I think that the business has gone through a tremendous transformation. So they've taken out a lot of costs. They have tremendous opportunity overseas. There are more and more cars. I mean, I've done a lot of overseas travel all over the place, Colombia, South Africa, just this year, um, heading to Southeast Asia soon. And everywhere you go, there's cars, 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 cars. And so there's a tremendous opportunity, I think, for auto parts over the long term. And so Federal Mogul is a play on that. That would be an example of something that uh, I've recommended recently that I like. Talk about transparency. I mean, why aren't they transparent? You know, these are publicly traded companies. They do all the they do all the filings as they're required to by law. How do you evaluate transparency? You're not just going with the basic requirements that the SEC puts out, right? That's correct. Yeah. I mean, this is more of a qualitative issue, but I would say that transparency business model has a, has a role in that. So off the bat, I'd say that almost any bank would fail transparency, except perhaps some of the smallest banks that are maybe thrifts and have very or have loan portfolios that you can get a pretty good handle on as far as what's in them. But for a large multi-billion dollar institution, there's just no way you can get inside that portfolio and get comfortable at all what kind of risks they're taking. And in fact, I would argue that the presidents and CEOs of these companies don't really know what kind of risks they're taking. Well, uh, I think if the last few years has taught us anything, yeah, that's right. it is that you are absolutely right. I think it also extends right. beyond that. I mean, you could take a, a business model that seems very simple, like say a natural gas pipeline, but it can be made to be very complicated and not transparent with financial engineering. So I've seen pipeline companies that have layered on top of that a number of derivatives buying and selling different, you know, natural gas, say, forward and so forth, that, that makes it not transparent. So uh, I think what it comes down to is you have to be able to understand how the business makes money. And it has to be pretty simple. So most of the time, because I have this limitation, I wind up investing in things that 
Uh, most of the companies I invest in are companies that make something because you can generally follow a manufacturing operation. You've got costs of input, they make something, and out it goes at a certain price. And you can get a better feel for uh, those kind of ideas or even like a retailer, although I haven't recommended any retailers in a very long time, or energy companies, a company that produces natural gas is something you can generally get a handle on or produces oil, uh, real estate companies. So these would be examples. So disclosure is a qualitative test and you have to just really be honest with yourself whether or not you understand what's going on in the business. There are certain red flags I think that you would look for. If you have a lot of, uh, we saw this in the last few years in the banks, you have these special purpose off balance sheet joint ventures and things that are contributing income and basically they're little black boxes and that's something you have to heavily discount. But in general it's a qualitative gut feel based on what you have discovered. You know what I get approached with uh, fairly regularly? Oil and gas exploration deals and oil and gas production deals. And when I say gas, I mean natural gas. And these are just small deals where, you know, a guy has a fund. Or and he's, something. Yeah, and he's raising a, a million dollars for a fund and he's going to all his friends and family and getting 50 grand from each person type thing. Do you have any thoughts about those? No, I, I think that those uh, that is an area that has been rife with problems in the past. So I would be particularly careful. I mean, you have to really know and trust the people. And I would, I would think you would have to have some basic knowledge of oil and gas so you know what you're getting into. But I haven't recommended any of those. I've seen a number of things like that. I've seen, I get, a, I see a lot of these kind of private deals too, private farmland deals, real estate, oil and gas. Those are all very popular. It's interesting, and, and definitely exploration would be incredibly risky versus production, which is less risky. But still, there is always a chance for fraud and so forth. So, Chris, you went to Saskatchewan recently, and it seems like your your trip there, you had some thoughts of commodities on your mind, didn't you? Yes, and uh, well, I went to Saskatchewan, and I had a couple of companies I was visiting. One company that I like very much that I visited there, which fits a lot of what we're talking about, is a company called Alliance Grain Traders. And that's a company where the people running it have a, have a big stake in it, the employees and the, in, the insiders own, I think, together 35% of the stock. So, uh, and the founder's still with it. It's only 10 years old. But Saskatchewan is an agricultural powerhouse, really. And Alliance Grain Traders processes pulses, which would be things like chickpeas and lentils and, and different kinds of beans. And so I was also going there because I've been writing about Saskatchewan. I've probably been writing about it for three or four years, maybe even longer, um, because some of the farmland deals out there are very interesting because the government there for a long time had a very tough view on foreign investors. And it's kind of funny because even if you were a Canadian, let's say you were born in Alberta, you couldn't buy Saskatchewan farmland. I mean, you had to be born in Saskatchewan to own Saskatchewan farmland. And they eased those rules. And so the investment started to flow in. And, and so there's a lot of interesting opportunities in Saskatchewan. It seems like really the safe play for the future is commodity-oriented things. You mentioned manufacturing companies, companies that make something tangible stuff. It's always great to hear about high flyers like Groupon that may not be such a high flyer when it finally has its IPO. Right. Maybe Fifty and, billion dollars for Facebook or something. Yeah, and <laughs> Facebook and and all these kind of like virtual companies. But if you ask me, the population is increasing dramatically. We're gonna we're gonna hit another billion mark this year, or maybe. We we just did hit that. I mean, nobody exactly knows the world population, but they have uh, lots of stats on that. And, you know, people consume. The three things people need, Chris, for sure, which which we absolutely know, they don't need a new pair of Nikes. They don't need a new iPhone. They'd love to have all these things, but we know for sure they need food, clothing, and shelter. Yeah, food, food, water, those are big, big investment themes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, no question about it. But people don't have the chance to do those directly in most cases. And, and we've talked about the deal maker philosophy, which I, I couldn't agree with more. But talk to us a little bit about housing, if you would. Well, I had a little background first, because I, I have been a housing bear for a long time. I know that. And that's why I want to hear from you on this. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And I mean, I go back as far as I think it was late 2002. I wrote a piece saying that Fannie and Freddie Mac would go bankrupt and the taxpayers would eventually have to bail them out. And I've been a long time talking and writing about the housing bubble. So only recently, this year, I reversed that p position. So I think now that we went through this whole big housing bubble, and I think the the thing is uh, dead, <laughs> and it, we are closer to the bottom than we are the next peak. I think that's for sure. I mean, you never call the exact bottom. But I think housing looks interesting. And I, I'll tell you, I talk to a lot of different investors and other people who are doing different things. And one of the things that has struck me recently is the amount of, institutional money that has started to look at housing as an investment where they're renting out the house and you know there's 
all kinds of uh, boots on the ground viewpoints from different people. But in general, what I'm hearing is that it's not so difficult to buy a, a home today and rent it and get an 8 to 12 percent cash yield on your investment. And I love that idea because I think, you know, you look at housing prices, they've come down tremendously. I mean, they've plummeted. And in some markets, I mean, it depends. There's a lot of ways to measure this. You can look at price to income and all that sort of thing. But we're definitely on the bottom rung of all these different uh, valuation methods. So I think, though it may take years before housing prices surge forward or we have another housing boom, uh, now I think is a pretty good position to, a pretty good time to establish some positions in, say, the rental home market and just sort of wait out the storm. I mean, where can you get 8 to 12%? Uh, on a physical, tangible asset, again, that has value, and this is another point in the valuation, is that most of these houses now, you can, you can easily find houses trading for well below replacement value, what it would cost you to rebuild them. So I think it's a very interesting place to be right now, and uh, I, I would say things look up from here for housing. As crazy as it says, sounds to say it. <laughs> yeah, and but uh, but I don't think it's crazy at all. I, I agree with you completely. But it's interesting to hear that from a guy who's been bearish on housing for so many years. I mean, you thought housing was a bad deal in 2002. And then, of course, the speculative frenzy and the money pump from the Greenspan pump, I'll call it, post 9-11 Greenspan pump, was just kicking out ridiculous amounts of money into housing for years. And the, the price is just, I mean, it was absurdity what was oh, going yes. on. Oh, yes. And I mean, we've seen this happen with all kinds of speculative blowoffs. I mean, I remember writing bearishly about the stock market in 97. And of course, you know, there were three years to go before it peaked and they were tremendous. You know, there's still a lot of tremendous room, room on that. So these things always, always go longer. But I think now too, when you look at the, the reason why I say it sounds nutty, it doesn't sound nutty to you and I'm not surprised because you're actually, you know, more of a pr practitioner who's in the market and sees the deals you can do. And most of the people I talk to like that completely agree with uh, the position I'm saying. But I do get a lot of resistance from readers who don't see that. And they just read sort of the headlines, which is, you know, still a lot of scary stuff about housing. So, uh, I mean, there's no question if you look at the U.S. mortgage market, something like 45% of U.S. mortgages are still in some state of trouble. They're either underwater or they're in foreclosure or something. But if you look at the individual deal as an investor, I think it's pretty attractive. Well, so when you invest in stocks and when you invest in companies, do you invest, are, are you an income-oriented investor or are you capital appreciation? I have a feeling I know the answer to this, but I, I just want to ask you. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that I'm indifferent to the two when I'm looking at a stock. I, I'm looking kind of sort of at total return. So sometimes income will play into it, but sometimes it won't at all. I mean, if I can you know, it just depends on the situation. I would say I'm indifferent to either or. What I want is the greatest total return overall that I think I can get. See, I, I would say that what, what people just fail to understand about real estate is that it's a multidimensional asset class. And, and companies, if they're dividend paying, have two dimensions. They have capital appreciation and they have income. They have dividends. But but with, with real estate, if it's the right kind of real estate, you have several dimensions. You have income, okay? And that's what you're saying when you say, look, at just, just get 8 to 12% rental yield return and wait it out with no capital appreciation. Who, who knows which way that's going to go? right? And so you're basically like investing in a bond or a dividend paying stock. The principal value of the bond or the stock can go up or down, but it still spins off the income for you, right? And, and then you've got the potential for capital appreciation. And I just want to propose an idea to you, Chris. I don't think we're going to see much, if any, real appreciation measured in real or constant dollars for a long time. Because for that to happen, we have to have incomes increase. And I don't think that's looking good for the, the foreseeable future here for the next five years or so. But I do think we will have inflation. And so I think in nominal dollars, we'll have increase in prices. Yes. And I think if you look at different times of, of rapid inflation, that houses in general have been a pretty good hedge on that, real estate in general. Certainly they have. and But it gets better because if you leverage the property, say you put 20% down, you don't just hedge against inflation. I had a guy on my show. You have show. an active short against the dollar, basically. An <laughs> yeah. active bet against you know, the, the purchasing power of the dollar. That's the brilliant thing about it. And you can fix it at such low interest rates now. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's an incredible deal. It is incredible because think about it. If you put 20% down, you're leveraging or shorting the dollar by a five to one ratio, right? So if the inflation rate is 5%, but you've leveraged and you're not paying the debt service cost on the leverage the tenant is, you, you've really out maneuvered inflation, assuming the real estate keeps even pays with inflation by a five to one ratio. Sure. Okay, so Absolutely. that's that's wonderful. a big part of it. Yeah, huge, huge. But it gets even better because, see, I don't think we're going to have any real appreciation for a long time. But I think we 
could have what I call regression to replacement cost. So if you buy a property now for say $50 a square foot and say that it cost $100 a square foot to rebuild that property today, plus you're basically getting the land for free. So in you know some of the markets we like, like Dallas, Phoenix, Indianapolis, Atlanta, and some others, the lot values are cheap in those markets. I mean, you know, it only costs for a, a single family home lot, 15 to $25,000. Yeah, I mean, I've heard some prices in Phoenix have been rolled back to where they were in 94. So. Oh, yeah, no, it's amazing. I mean, listen, I, I just recently moved to Arizona from California. I, I left Newport Beach to move to Scottsdale and some people think I'm crazy. I think I'm brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I like it a lot better out here. And yeah, it's amazing. I mean, things are half half price. I mean, this was obviously a huge bubble here and it blew up. So, so even if there's no real appreciation, all you have to have happen to really double the price of these properties or even triple them, because sometimes we buy at one third the value of replacement, is just have what I call regression to replacement costs. What do you think of that? No, I think that's, uh, I think that's exactly right. I think long term, you do have a regression to replacement. And that, I see that in the stock market also with a lot of different assets. Things will fall dramatically out of favor for a while. But over time, markets kind of correct themselves. And I think that will happen in housing one way or the other. You know, there'll be some supply that will disappear. There'll be houses that are torn down or whatever. There'll be, they're still, demographically, the U.S. is still in a pretty decent place, especially compared to Western Europe. We've got a country of 300 million still growing. That's going to just naturally soak up some supply. I mean, household formation in the U.S. is still growing apace. And the market will adjust. We're not, you know, housing starts are at very, very low levels. And it will be patchy. So, I mean, you mentioned your specific market. And I think that's important to note is that, you know, there are some markets that will come back and that will be attractive. And there are some that may never come back. I mean, I know reading different stories about, you know, whole towns in Florida that basically grew up, you know, only because of the housing bubble. And there's really no reason otherwise for the town to exist. So I'd be, le- <laughs> I'd be much less uh, inclined point. to make an investment there than, say, like a Tampa. Well, you know Tampa eventually. You know, that's a city. It's got a reason for being. It's been there for a long time. That will come back. And Phoenix will come back. And some of these other places will come back. But I think you do have to be kind of choosy. And, and just, I, I think what you're referring to in Florida is the central Florida areas. That that's just right. Those, literally, th- those were literally nothing more more than a symptom of Wall Street and bank money flowing at developers. All towns created from just out of credit, and they're all they are as houses in the middle of where no or nothing else is. Yeah, know? right, right, so absolutely. The point I want to make there is I think regression to replacement cost is not appreciation. I don't think that's appreciation. It's just regression. Right, although it depends where you bought, right? If you bought half if you bought it for half replacement value, it'll be appreciation for you specifically, but it's just it's just getting back to a more normal market. So Chris, that's interesting what you say about housing, especially because you've been a bear for so many years. So I, I really like to hear that. It, it gives me a lot of confidence that I'm, I'm doing the right thing. But I'd be interested to hear your take on Warren Buffett. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm beginning to think Warren Buffett is like a shill for the Obama administration. I mean, you know, he's he's throwing fundraisers for for Obama, and he's doing things that just don't make any sense. I mean, but but he's he's got a huge insider advantage. Like, you know, he just bought a bunch of B of A stock. Did that make sense? And he was also he's also kind of hypocritical because he'll talk about taxes and that, and then he'll be sure that when he does these deals, he's in preferred stock, seventy percent of the dividends of which are tax deductible, and so on and so forth. I mean, his actions betray what he's what he's saying if he, if he wants to pay more taxes that's just one issue i mean he's not the only stopping him from writing a much bigger check to the treasury you know i'm sure they'll take whatever money they get but, but he, he for for some reason he says that his taxes should go up yet he doesn't do that and he doesn't do that that's what I, that's exactly the point. and what i heard about it is his famous line his secretary pays more taxes than he does is that he only pays himself a one hundred thousand dollar year actual salary and he takes the rest of his money in a more preferred means that's taxed at a much lower rate and it's interesting to me that Warren Buffett's secretary doesn't make a hundred grand a year. I mean, <laughs> you're you're the secretary for the second richest man in the United States of America and one of the richest people on the planet. And I mean, that that's a, I don't think he's paying her enough. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to Warren Buffett, I think that you know, as investors, it's definitely uh, when you're looking to learn about investing to study his career because it's it was been a remarkable run. But the Warren Buffett of the last, I don't know three to five years or so, has been much more of a political animal. I mean, not just the taxes, but on all kinds of issues, like you say. So, you know, he's fallen down some pegs in a lot of people's minds. But 
but you know, one of the things, like when I read Buffett biographies and so forth, I kind of like his philosophy. It's sort of the value investing, buy good, sensible companies, not the high flyers that just have underlying value and operate and hold. And that sort of strikes me as a good philosophy. Yeah, and I think you can. I think you can divide Warren Buffett kind of in three careers. There's sort of the early Warren Buffett when he ran the first Buffett partnership, and he was involved in special situations and doing things like Ben Graham cigar butt investing. And then there's sort of the middle years, where he became more of the Warren Buffett that most people know, the guy who espouses all that folksy investing wisdom and common sense advice that you talked about. And then there's quarter of the latter years where he's become so large where he can really only buy whole companies and where he's become much more, I think, less interesting <laughs> to study as an investor and where he's become much more political. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. That's a good way to divide him up, definitely. Well, hey, Chris, what else would you like people to know before you go? And of course, please give out your website. And, and, and you publish two different newsletters people should know about. And tell us where they can get those. Yes, I would say the best place to go is the dailyreckoning.com. I write columns there, Daily Reckoning. It's a free e-letter. comes out every day. And uh, you can find out more about my newsletters there. And like I say, it's free, so it can't beat that. Absolutely. And, and it's a great newsletter. Bill Bonner is a terrific writer, and I, I just really enjoy the, the philosophy. I, I will say it's a little long-winded, but, but it's, it's entertaining. I, I love the way they, they just sort of bash the left-leaning political world and so forth. It's, it's funny. It's really good. But in closing, you know, what thoughts would you have for people looking forward? And any thoughts you have about the future of the economy, inflationary, deflationary, insolvency for the United States, <laughs> whatever you got? The inflation thing, I, I tend to think uh, that we'll see it sooner or later. I mean, uh, this is one of those things where uh, a lot of people have been looking for it, including me, and have been wrong for a few years. But uh, I think it's inevitable. And this most recent episode with Operation Twist, where they're driving down interest rates even further. I mean, there just can't be much more room to go there. So I, I think that uh, we'll, we'll see more inflation. And overall, I would say, though, that there's still a lot of investment opportunity out there. So I try not to get so down too much on the macro economy, because there's lots of instances in the past where you can look at the two, and they don't necessarily dance together. In other words, you can make pretty good investments in bad times, and there's lots and lots of examples of that. So uh, I would say stick with those basic principles that, that we've been talking about in this interview. Look for uh, to invest with people you know that have track records, that are having their incentives are lined up with yours. Stay picky. You know, you don't, the great thing about investing is you don't have to uh, invest. You can sort of wait until that perfect pitch comes along. So that's my, really my parting, uh, parting wisdom, I guess. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Chris Mayer, thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate having you on the show. That's been fun. Thank you. The American Monetary Association is a nonprofit venture funded by the Jason Hartman Foundation, which is dedicated to educating people about the practical effects of monetary policy and government actions on inflation, deflation, and personal freedom. Our goal is to help people prosper in the midst of uncertain economic times. This show is produced by the Jason Hartman Foundation, all rights reserved. For publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate professional if you require individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own and the host is acting on behalf of the Jason Hartman Foundation exclusively.